I am delighted to welcome uh, my old friend Bob Brenner, Robert Brenner, who is an enormously influential historian of capitalism. Uh, He's also the director of the Center of Social Theory and Comparative History at UCLA and editor of uh, the journal Against the Current and editorial member of New Left Review. Uh, Bob's great original uh, splash was his contribution to the debates on the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And these are so influential that they are now called the Brenner debates. Uh, it's not easy to have a portion of discussion of, of history and theory named after yourself. So that's quite a contribution. He's written on many, many aspects of capitalism. I'm just gonna pick out a few. Obviously the first thing, which is the uh, Brenner debates was around the agricultural agrarian caste structure in uh, industrial Europe and the relation of that to the transition to uh, industrial economy, merchants, and uh, political conflicts in pre-industrial uh, Europe. Uh, he's also written on long waves, a subject of great interest to me, long booms and bubbles in the world economy, uh, the economic and social foundations of growth, a really fundamental question right now and always, the causes of the 2007 global crisis, which has title I particularly like, which is what is good for Goldman Sachs is good for America. You will recognize that famous twist on a General Motors quote. Bob is uh, a wonderfully uh, influential person, as I said, uh, in the original debates, especially the Brenner debates on the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And so it's particularly nice and interesting that his talk today is called The Transition from Capitalism to Feudalism. Uh, so with that, I welcome you, Bob. Welcome you again, because you've been here before. We're really happy to have you. Thanks uh, so much, Anu. Um, and uh, to the others at, in the economics department, the new school, for uh, choosing to invite me. It's a, it's a great honor. And I should say it's a great pleasure because uh, I've, you know, from way back, uh, I've, you know, connected with uh, the people in that, many of the people in that department. Uh, Where did you go? What? Sorry? Oh, someone's got their mic on. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and very much learned uh, from the people in the department. Um, when I was uh, uh, kind of trying to move from my historical work to more uh, contemporary work in the post-war economy, um, actually Anwar Sheikh, that other than Anu, um, uh, invited me to to spend uh, a semester um, at the at the new school, and it came at a, at a really great time. And uh, being there with the economists there helped me begin to um, make, so to speak, the transition to um, contemporary uh, the uh, to the study of the contemporary economy as well as the historical question of the transition. So. Um, Thanks very very much. Uh, what I'm what I'm going to try, uh, what I'm going to do. I hope people will see the uh, the set of um, graphs and tables. And so I'll essentially uh, give my talk and uh, try, if I can, to um, at the same time, no easy task for me, to um, keep the tables and graphs in sync with the uh, presentation. Okay. I just wanted to see what, um, what the time is. Okay. I have 940, so I guess it, it's 1240 there, not 
we're not too abysmally late in starting. Okay, you would have had to have been stuck on Mars for the past couple of decades with Matt Damon to be unaware to, of the astounding concentration of income and wealth that has overtaken the US economy. As we know from the path-breaking studies of Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Sayers, and Gabriel Zuckman, and, and by now many others, the shares of the top 1% and top one-tenth of a percent by, uh, by income in the US are today at levels higher than at any other point since World War I, except perhaps for a year or two in the late 1920s. The same is true for fractions of we wealth, uh, not just income held by the richest Americans. So the polarization of income and wealth in the US today is as extreme as at any other point in, in American history. Yet there's another feature of today's economy that is of equal, if not greater significance, but which has attracted less attention. Uh, this is the historic weakness of growth, not just the maldistribution of income and wealth. In no other period has the US economy done so badly for so long and its performance has gotten ever worse over time. It's the current period's combination of economic stagnation and the polarization of uh, wealth and income that it is the subject of this presentation. Uh, so just for an overview to, so people can see what I'm talking about, uh, I've had on the screen um, this table called Declining Economic uh, Dynamism, which gives an idea of the uh, fall off uh, in uh, growth and all these in this set of uh, centrally important uh, variables of the um, world economy. So that's the first one, declining economic dynamism. The second one is on the world, uh, world economy. Uh, and it is the, it gives, it's a bar graph on the growth of world GDP and world GDP per capita. Uh, and that's on your screen now, and it uh, should give you uh, an idea of the a parallel way of presenting that same uh, trend to uh, slow down, especially starting uh, in the in the in the 70s after a long uh, post-war uh, boom. So that that's the um, kind of the. Uh, initial um, background picture that I'm going to try to uh, get behind, so to speak. Now, <clears throat> uh, the deep recession that began in the early, in early 19, in early 2020, and the, buy, uh, and the bailout of the corporations that constituted the bipartisan uh, establishments signature response to it represent the culmination and near perfect instantiation of the two interconnected tendencies that have shaped the US political economy for almost half a century. Uh, these, uh, which I'll uh, be focusing on in this talk. First, relentlessly declining economic dynamism from around 1970 uh, following the golden age or post-war boom. Secondly, politically driven uh, upward redistribution of income and wealth to the very topmost layers of the population starting in around 1980. People should note those two uh, starting dates, 1970 for the uh, long downturn uh, 1980 for the turn to politically driven upward redistribution of income and wealth. So starting as far back
as the NIC form system by day. I have the Pratt Wilder cycles from 2008 to 2020, by far the weakest uh, across the board in terms of all. Bob. Uh, Bob, we've losing your, we've lost your sound. Uh, uh, yeah, now it's back. Now it's back. Yeah, now it's back. Yeah, now it's back. Yes, we also okay. lost the last uh, couple minutes of your talk because I think your connection uh, was not great. So if maybe you can take it back just a little bit. Okay. Did you got the kind? Of Dr. E, the uh, thing in the back, uh, to come back to, uh, to the uh, beginning following the, um, the general introduction. Hello? So, hello. Yeah, I don't, I think the connection is not working very well. So, maybe you can try taking off the video. Turn off the video. Um, I Let me just see if something else is going on uh, in the house that's causing problems here. Okay? Yes. Great. Right. Thank you. So we we've lost you when you said about the two important dates, 1970 uh, the, this, and, and 1980 as the moment in which we see the um, the big divide in, in 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 incomes and wealth. Okay, maybe what I should do is just uh, go uh, go back a little before that. It's pretty much uh, after the introduction in the talk, and and probably that'll be make sure that everybody's on the same page, okay? So uh, so I, let me know now if, if, I'm, if there's any difficulty in hearing me. Okay. The deep recession that began in early 2020 and the bailout of the corporations uh, that constituted the bipartisan establishment's sing signature response to it represent the culmination and near perfect instantiation of the two interconnected tendencies that have shaped the US political economy for almost half a century. And it shouldn't say the, but uh, two important ones. First, relentlessly declining economic dynamism from around 1970, following the long post-war boom. Second, politically driven upward redistribution of income and wealth to the very top layers of the population starting around 1980. So people should know, should note those two starting dates, the long downturn, uh, the half century since 1970, and then um, following that, a political, a major political economic adjustment to the slowdown, uh, which uh, begins around 1980, uh, and the emphasis then on politically driven redistribution uh, to the very top layers of the population. So starting as far back as the Nixon Ford presidencies, we see steadily worsening economic performance, business cycle by business cycle, decade by decade, right up to the present with the last of the cycles uh, from 2008 to 2020 by far the weakest across the board in terms of all the major uh, macro, uh, all the major macroeconomic indicators. Um, secondly, from the start of the Reagan, Reagan administration, the country's top political leaders gave up any consistent commitment to artificially reviving growth and turned instead to directly political means to hand income to the top 1% above while treating the well being of the economy and the population as a second thought. It's not that um, economic policy to support um, economic expansion disappeared, but the emphasis of, of policy shifted radically toward the uh, reproduction of, of the very top layers in the economy. Um, <clears throat> 
I should say that during the pandemic recession of the last year, these trends reached their most extreme point, something of a, culmin uh, something of a culmination. In the uh, pandemic recession, a uh, huge drop off, uh, the, worst, uh, uh, the worst recession of the post-war period. And at the same time, uh, the opposite side of the same coin, despite the profound problems of the economy, the rich did extremely well with billionaires uh, growing a trillion dollars richer in that very short period. So that's the, uh, that, those are the developments I want to focus on in uh, the um, remainder of the talk. Uh, so, to be, uh, so to begin with, um, <clears throat> the issue of stagnation, slowdown. Paradoxically, what I would say is that the slow, the slow growth that characterized um, um, uh, US, the US economy in the first post-war quarter century, and especially the uh, first part of that, um, was the result paradoxically of the exercise by the US of hegemony. Uh, in a sense, hegemony it ha is replacing uh, the dominance that uh, the US economy the U and the US political economy enjoyed uh, the morrow of World War II. What we all know that on from uh, 1945, um, the US commanded uh, uh, an unprecedented combination of economic and political and military power uh, and was in a position essentially to dictate, uh, dictate terms. Now, the first reflex of, of the, uh, of the uh, US polity at that moment was to use its overwhelming dominance to uh, essentially extend the growing, uh, I, I guess, I, growing, I can't think of another word from dominant, the, the, to extend the, the, the dominance that had been built up in the uh, first in the first half of the tw uh, 20th century, and especially uh, during uh, World War II. Um, U.S. following World War II, U.S. Um, policymakers were um, uh, looking for new so sources of demand to allow the co continuation of U.S. expansion to sustain the uh, post-war boom. And they, the first thing they uh, in, aim to impose is a, cent a kind of uh, liberal order, free trade, free investment order, um, which was incarnated uh, in the first instance in the Bretton Woods uh, uh, conference and the, um, what came out of that, uh, the idea was an equal playing field, everyone free to participate and compete um, uh, on the same uh, basis. Uh, naturally, the U US policymakers hit on this approach because of the US's overwhelming uh, uh, productive advantage. And in, indeed, in the first, in the first um, couple of years uh, after uh, 1945, uh, US dominance was uh, complete, especially not only because of its uh, long time build up of productive capacity, but the weakness of the rest of the world economy or much of the leading sectors of the rest of the world economy as a result of uh, World War II and the, uh, the depression in World War II, which left most economies at a further, um, dis a further uh, disadvantage. So the, U the US policymakers aim to uh, aim to uh, take advantage of 
uh, th that uh, that position of of dominance and and indeed from 45 to 47 uh, everything went the U.S.'s way. Uh, it did so. How, uh, however, to an extent, to uh, a self undermining extent. So the U.S. dominated the world market. Uh, growth in every uh, you know, uh, uh, leadership across the board. But what it meant was um, set a series of surpluses uh, in, uh, in uh, the world in, in the international economy piling up in the U.S. deficits in the uh, in the U.S.'s uh, economic partners, uh, which had it continued would have forced essentially the U.S.'s trading partners to back out, uh, you know, of the uh, back out of this uh, post-war order. The, the free trade order was just uh, too destructive. And so out of that, uh, having attempted to, uh, to confirm its dominance, it ended up having to, uh, in effect, uh, move to take into account the economic uh, needs of its uh, partners and, and rivals. And in, in, uh, in that way, it pursued its own interests. So the US moved forward by way of hegemony rather than uh, domination. And this uh, put its stamp on the first post-war uh, quarter, quarter century. So what you had as a result of American uh, hegemonic uh, approach to the to the world economy in the uh, after about 1947 was on the one hand the opening of the way to export oriented growth on the part of uh, the U.S.'s leading competitors. Um, uh, so what? They did uh, with the quote help uh, of the U.S. Uh, was to move to make, to um, consolidate its competitiveness, uh, their competitiveness, I should say, the rivals' competitiveness at the expense of the U.S. And what you got was. Uh, uh, Austerity, devaluation of the of currencies, uh, certain amount. The U.S. allowed a certain amount of protection in Europe, a certain amount of free trade in the U.S. Uh, the result was, uh, put it briefly, the U.S. the dynamism, the uh, uh, unprecedented precedented dynamism of the in the world economy focused on the later developers in Europe and Japan. So um, export-oriented growth on the part of the US's par par partners and rivals. How could the US, uh, which after all made possible this outcome, how is that, how were they able to do this? Uh, that what the key here was the ability of the US's greatest industrial corporations to undertake a huge reorientation to essentially multinational production. So what you got was with alongside Europe, Europeans and Japanese turned to uh, exports, the Americans turned to foreign direct investment, scaring the world for lower, cheaper costs to combine uh, with the US high technology uh, and um, so looking for cheap factors uh, around the world to exploit the dominant um, technology that the US um, that the US disposed of at, at this point. So um, that was the uh, essentially two pronged um, 
settlement that ultimately uh, emerged in the late 40s and 50s, and it made for unprecedentedly rapid growth. Uh, the US's rivals and competitors um, were able to grow very, very rapidly by seizing shares of the world market, not just uh, occupying their own place, but uh, uh, taking ever um, greater shares of the world market. Um, uh, sorry, uh, the world market um, uh, Uh, yeah, sorry, greater shares of the world market uh, from, from the Americans. Um, and I'm, if you look at the number four, uh, which should be on the screen in front of you, this is a uh, line graph on the growth of world exports over the period. And what you see is the uh, later develop, developing producers um, uh, bit by bit, uh, prospering through taking greater shares of the world export trade. Uh, the heart of the, it initially, you have Western European, the West Europeans and Japanese uh, in that position. They soon, you got following that, the uh, you know, Southeast Asian economy, the East Asian NICS, the Southeast Asian uh, little uh, tigers, and finally the big one, which which was uh, which was of course China. So, uh, uh, on the, so that's on the one hand the uh, growing shares, uh, uh, exports, gro export oriented growth on the part of the U.S.'s partners. Um, and on the other hand, a growing orientation to uh, overseas investment by the U.S.'s uh, leading corporations. And you can see that in uh, table three now uh, on, the, on the screen. Foreign Internationalization was the way forward from the standpoint of the uh, uh, partners and competitors. That meant export oriented growth. Standpoint of the US, it meant, um, sorry, foreign direct investment, glo globalization. So you have already with the US um, a, a dominant tr trend to globalization in the 50s, especially in and, and the 60s. So, however, uh, uh, the <clears throat> while the the process of that two pronged process of internationalization brought incredibly rapid growth, a famous golden age. Nevertheless, sooner rather than later, it entailed very major contradictions, which um, were very soon um, quite evident. The same trends that brought rapid growth also brought self-undermining of the economy. And so the question is, how, how was that? Why was that? Because this is the... We're, what we're moving here to is try to understand the trend to stagnation, to slow down, um, and we'll, we'll follow that with uh, this, the issue of uh, politically driven upward redistribution. So uh, <clears throat> the, those who succeeded in the uh, uh, Post, during the post-war boom, uh, were the ones then who succeeded in the general process of internationalization that dominated this period. But the 
this was not a process that occurred smoothly. It was contradictory at its heart. Um, so what you have is the later developers, meaning develop the dynamic uh, exporters of Western Europe, uh, um, Japan, then East Asia, uh, what you have with, with them is they are, they are entering into the global economy, as you might expect, uh, taking their place uh, in the world division of labor. But they did not do so in the manner that Adam Smith uh, would have uh, prescribed, specializing um, essentially um, everyone producing for everyone, everyone else. Um, that what, what the form of post-war advance was that you had later developers entering into the world market, producing the same goods as before. They effectively copied um, American, uh, at least at first, but it was, it was, this was a pattern that uh, persisted. They, they combined the highest, um, uh, they borrowed the highest uh, technology available and connected it with low cost of production, particularly uh, low wages. And in doing so, uh, they armed themselves for um, a struggle for market share. And so the, from the very beginning, the post-war growth took place through a fight for market share. Uh, <clears throat> and what we see are that those who are able to succeed are the ones who are able to grow rapidly, are the ones who are able to undertake export-led growth or export-oriented growth uh, or foreign investment, that is internationalization, um, to uh, take a, to successfully operate within the, glo the global economy. So on the one hand, we have the successful later developers expanding through export-oriented growth, one kind of wave after another, Germany, Japan, Western Europe, ultimately the East Asian NICs, the uh, Korea, Taiwan, etc., and the uh, uh, city states of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, Southeast Asian tigers, and finally, of course, the big one. Um, so, uh, on the one hand, uh, that is the uh, the pattern of the later develop it. Uh, the dynamic later developing economy, especially from East Asia. Uh, on the other hand, cannot, but in the same breath, talk about the successful earlier developer uh, expanding not through uh, exports, but foreign direct investment, the export of capital. Um, and so the, as, as I said, this pattern of development, while dynamic, quickly led uh, to problems because the most successful producers are producing what's already produced, being produced in the world market, but cheaper. Manufacturing is at the core of what's being traded internationally. So what you get is uh, not deep economics here, but too much supply compared to demand supply outrunning demand leading to overcapacity, driving down prices lead, um, uh, and, dri and driving down prices. So problems of holding on to market share, problems of uh, a squeeze on prices. Uh, so uh, questions of ca capacity, capacity utilization, questions of intensified competition, Competition and 
and here's where um, the payoff or cost is uh, registered. And this is in the, in the, um, in, in terms of profitability. So if you hear the kind of uh, anodyne first shot at what's going on, uh, US non-financial corporate sector pro net profit rate can see that um, the uh, profitability is maintained into the later 60s. Uh, after that, uh, there, the fall in the rate of profit leads to a the, the long downturn that has characterized um, the US uh, and much of the rest of the world economy ever since. Uh, so here would be the the uh, in 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 uh, chart number in in chart number six, uh, you have the manufacturing rate of profit that I was just discussing, and across the board, U.S., U.K., Germany, Japan, South Korea, all of these um, because of the their um, partaking of the their 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 uh, moving forward through world um, I'm sorry world uh, exports uh, you're ending up with overcapacity everywhere and uh, the result is everywhere a falling profitability I hope people can see that uh, certainly by the by about 1980, uh, the, this trend is uh, um, affecting all of the, in, you know, all of the great industrial powers. Here is the same thing in, um, sorry, chart number seven, USA, Germany, Japan, Korea, the UK, the fall in the manufacturing rate of profit, which is where the action is in a sense in the um, in prov provoking a world slowdown. Um, just to uh, complete the picture, following the um, the issue of uh, the question of profitability outside manufacturing, um, basically, uh, there is there is uh, stability, so it's in the in the world market in the intensification of competition in the world market, which takes place in manufacturing, that is the root of um, overcapacity and the and the fall in profitability and in turn the uh, long downturn, the long, the, the long slowdown. I hope people can see this. USA, Germany, Japan, uh, essentially being affected by in, in manufacturing, but not beyond it, uh, but not beyond it. Okay. So, <clears throat> Okay. Another way of effectively um, summarizing that trend is that where production is taking place through entry into easy entry into the world market, that is manufacturing, it's there that overcapacity emerges there that there's a downward pressure and profitability and that is the um, essentially driving force of uh, of slowdown um, one way to see this is that by comparing and this is in, in um, table nine 
just to kind of put the icing on the cake. In table nine, you have the uh, a comparison here of the American manufacturing and non-manufacturing sectors, their profit rates. And you can see that throughout the period, outside manufacturing, there is uh, the rate of profit is flat. Um, uh, it's in manufacturing that the action is occurring, and uh, this you have the um, and you have there the roots of the uh, slowdown. Now, um, So um, this focus on the profit rate, especially uh, in manufacturing, but uh, also in comparison, uh, non-manufacturing, you get a, a picture of the, um, <clears throat> you, you get uh, the, the source of slowdown because the um, fallen profitability makes for reductions in investment and reductions in, in turn in uh, productivity, uh, as well as re, uh, to counter those reductions in uh, real wages. And so the flip side, as it were, of falling profit rate is a problem of uh, global demand. Oh boy. I'm going way too slowly. Um, and virtually from the beginning, um, this problem of um, demand, the stagnation that's evident in the American economy from very early on is met by a turn to what we know as uh, Keynesianism, even as early as the as the fifties, you have a you have a um, the establishment of permanent military expenditures, a kind of ballast for the uh, for the economy. And then from Kennedy onward, uh, you ha you get the adoption of classical countercyclical policies, which are adopted more ever more intensely over the next cu couple of decades. Um, so what might have started out as short-term countercyclical uh, policies to counter growth, especially uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, ends up as a permanent feature of the U.S. economy. It's almost as if Joan Robinson's bastard Keynesianism uh, was adopted from 1960 to 1980 as a kind of elixir for decline uh, to counter uh, that is the decline. Um, <clears throat> uh, so you have roughly 20 years from 1960 to not, from the early 60s to early 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s of um, ever greater dependence on deficit spending, easy money, and from the standpoint of the US to some degree, uh, uh, a turn to devaluation uh, to increase uh, competitiveness. Yet this development by the end of the 70s um, has what 
was clearly for its exponents, a shocking result. Uh, you have this um, universally uh, touted and universally supported turn to Keynesianism, uh, as, as I just said, a bipartisan policy, a bipartisan consensus behind it um, uh, through most of the 70s. But what was shocking was that these policies uh, did not work. The, you, got, uh, in, you got inflation instead of growth. And this opens the way by the end of the 70s uh, to the, the change that we were talking, the other, the second change that we we're talking about, the shift to politically driven upward um, redistribution. Um, the, the what uh, sometimes called um, neoliberalism. Uh, you had a kind of a background you have a kind of demoralization and disillusion as people who, as the, everyone had expected this Keynesianism to, to work. And when it didn't, um, the, 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 the I, I guess you would say, the, it, the elites that came, that were in, uh, in, um, in control from, the start of the 80s, especially this is really the late Carter, uh, Reagan uh, administrations, um, they, because of the failure, unexpected failure of Keynesianism, they are open to a very uh, major shift of a sort that had not previously been contemplated. And this is the, of course, the shift to uh, neoliberalism. Um, uh, now, uh, what is neoliberalism? It's a, it's a term that's universally used, but I think you have to be a bit careful about how you're using it and what you mean by it. Uh, <clears throat> in, in one sense, um, there is no, um, nothing new about neoliberalism uh, as it's um, put into effect in the 80s. Uh, because on the one hand, it's about the globalization of the economy, which had been dominant, uh, if not always uh, totally prominent uh, throughout the post-war period. Um, so in one sense, the shift to neoliberalism is not really a shift at all. It's a every emphasis on the fundamental orientation to globalization, free markets, uh, free trade, uh, free investment. Um, and that had been a defining feature of the American, econ American political economy from the 50s. So it was in, always in some sense liberal uh, and became in the sense of globalization more liberal. <clears throat> but on the other hand, a major shift did occur. And it's this that I want to emphasize as parale paralleling the, uh, the, the sort of growth, the, the continuity and intensification of globalization. And what you're having here is uh, just the cut to the chase is essentially the turn to politically driven upward redistribution, predation or ripoff um, in order in to parallel the, uh, globalization. Uh, it, and what this represents is, is very clear and but very surprising in context, which is that um, there, the which is that the um, what had been expected to prevail, the Keynesianism that was expected to prevail had uh, failed completely, and so the what is left is 
uh, less on, on, uh, emphasis on that, uh, give up on the emphasis of national economy uh, implied by Keynesianism, national economy uh, of Keynesianism plus various forms of content. Uh, uh, sorry, um, various uh, forms of protection. Um, and instead, uh, globalization, and then this politically driven upward redistribution. You, the essentially the focus shifts, not this is an emphasis, not uh, you know you you know not uh, pure development, but a shift in emphasis um, to uh, uh, adju adjust to the stagnation of the economic pie by means of political. Uh, Re redistribution. Um, the economic pie is growing ever more slowly in spite of their best efforts. So sections of the political and economic establishment essentially cut the cord. And instead of, um, and give up the pressure to uh, enhance economic growth and capital accumulation. Um, and uh, essentially, this was allowed to proceed uh, without too much interference. But they, what was different was a focus on uh, the uh, use of political methods to to uh, to uh, redistrib redistribution. And what we have essentially is that innovation that's taking place, of course, there is plenty of innovation that continues, but we, we have a very uh, slow growing economy, slow growing productivity, and the innovations that are taking place are in terms of appropriation and redistribution much more than uh, production. So what you have are the top corporate managers, especially from finance, uh, numbers of the very rich, Aligning with top politicians in both parties to make possible this policies that allow for polit politically driven upward redistribution. And uh, what this means uh, is the turn of the econ uh, political economy very much the benefit of the top 1% and above uh, with made possible by privileges provided by the politician, politician. So uh, the corporations, corporate managers, the rich, especially in finance, provide funding for the political parties and especially pay us for top, uh, top politicians. In exchange, uh, they get a piece of the action made possible by political privilege. Uh, in a sense, uh, this is the uh, kind of uh, smidgen of truth that would um, allow for talking about the, uh, in a kind of uh, not too serious a way, but uh, indicative uh, transition from capitalism to feudalism, a shift to uh, political privilege as one very important key in the reproduction of the elite, the dominant class. So everybody who's been living in the in America knows we had this the emergence of the so-called donor class discipline, disciplining effectively both parties, especially top leadership of both parties. And maybe we could say that um, the key moment along the way is probably the, uh, uh, the, uh, the citizens, um, case of Citizens United. So just bring this to a, a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, to clarify essentially the argument here, 
is that what you could say previously, um, and I think this is kind of the underlying quote theoretical point, is that um, up, you know, during the first part of the post-war boom, the political parties uh, following one another uh, in control of government were operating in terms of the uh, principle of what's good for General Motors is good for everyone. What does this mean? It means that <clears throat> um, Uh, what this what this what this means is that it's um, the logic of politics, the logic of policy for everyone is to see to the uh, success, the productive success of the corporations uh, through. Um, uh, seeing to their profitability through their uh, uh, technological capacity. Everyone benefits uh, from this focus. What's good for General Motors is good for not just the capitalists, but supposedly for the rest of the working class. There would be money under these conditions for uh, uh, of growing pie, for state spending, uh, employment, investment, innovation, and as uh, and to emphasize um, the uh, um, growth of the uh, welfare state and the in general the growth of the of political intervention, uh, economic intervention on the part of uh, the the state. So uh, that's the logic of policy. Uh, in the first part of the post-war period, what's good for General Motors is good for everyone as approach to politics. What changed, uh, I'm sorry, coach of political economy, what um, changed is giving up essentially, or uh, the failure and adaption to the failure of this approach from the you know 70s onward and what you get instead instead of the um, capitalist logic of what's good for General Motors uh, making greater profits for the capitalists to trickle down to everyone else um, instead of that abstract approach to improvement um, you get more or less the uh, you get a break with that, and po and political economy comes about handing over privileges and gains to particular interests, um, which gives you the uh, you could say some analogy to old regime economy, pre-capitalist economy, uh, so uh, very different from uh, the uh, you know the the what had previously prevailed. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, in this context, the where this yeah, where this uh, comes up, I think, most dramatically and spectacularly, uh, and I think this is the real payoff of the work of Piketty and Sayers and their collaborators. Because what you're seeing is, and is from about 1980 is a enormous discontinuity, which is really striking and fits with what we are talk, talking about a minute ago about the shift to politically driven upward redistribution. So uh, through the 
whole of the post-war period, really, during world, from World War II, II through the whole of the 70s, the proportion of income going to the top 1% or top 10% doesn't change pre, and stays pretty much flat. So what you have in the early 40s, that income distribution is the same as what you have through the, uh, through the 1980. But after that, you get Sorry. But after that, as I said, you get the um, essentially the uh, payoff of this shift uh, that to politically driven upward redistribution taking place from around uh, 1980. And the, the Piketty Sayers material kind of confirms this, uh, uh, this uh, chronology. So if people look at um, table 14, um, income inequality in the US and UK, top 1%, and then compare that uh, with Germany, Japan, France, and Sweden, uh, you can see that um, the, after a long period of um, uh, essentially flat or even declining share of income to the top 1% that goes right through 1980, more or less suddenly at this point, you get this sharp upward uh, uh, trend in um, income inequality, income redistribution, and that politically driven redistribution that I'm talking about is, in my opinion, uh, what you're seeing in this, in, in this uh, wonderful research uh, work by Piketty and his uh, collaborators. So um, it, is, it is essentially uh, <clears throat> uh, So in effect, what I think the emphasis that comes with, uh, with the work of Piketty uh, is a, an ability to cash out this notion of, uh, if you, you follow this, of uh, the, you know, effectively the, the post-war boom and indeed the uh, attempt to revive the economy through Keynesianism of the 70s. All through this period, uh, a flat or actually declining share of top 1%, uh, going to the top 1%. But then comes with 1980, this uh, turn to um, upward redistribution uh, through uh, political means. And uh, this is really the, in effect, uh, the uh, payoff of the um, interpretation that I'm uh, 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 offering. Um, and uh, I'm going to just conclude by pointing to the the politically driven developments that are bringing about that redistribution to the top 10%, especially the top 1%. First, um, most obvious, uh, the decline in taxation, taxes a percentage of, 
uh, non-financial corporate profits um, can see the enormous decline that takes place. And um, it partly it, it was taking place already in the boom, but you see a very sharp fall off in tax the percentage of, of profits from uh, 1980, uh, as, as we're talking about. Then um, at the same time, uh, you it, within the uh, this politically driven upward redistribution, the financial sector is um, is very much the um, uh, is very much uh, the major beneficiaries. And I want to just uh, 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 linger on this for one second, uh, and then and then uh, and then and then conclude. Um, Yeah, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so paradoxically, I think you could say that the period where um, the let, let, what you might uh, call um, the, the classic period of the connection between finance and the real economy, uh, which parallels actually in its character, the uh, Rudolf Hil Hilferding's notion of finance capital actually is taking place in the first part of the post-war period. And what you have there is the close connection between the banks and the productive corporations, this, uh, this uh, symbiosis. Um, they work uh, very closely together when the corporations uh, move into, uh, American corporations move in uh, abroad, they're followed by uh, the banks. So classic, um, uh, development charted uh, by Hilferding, finance capital in paradoxically, meaning the merger of finance and production uh, and it, um, to, the to the benefit of production, the, uh, the symbiosis of the two. But what you're talking about after that, when you're talking about <clears throat> the uh, so in a sense, you could say you have the, uh, the rise of finance um, in that period where um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, so but uh, then uh, in when what we're talking about uh, uh, after 1980, is the rise of finance in a second sense, which is uh, not so much a shift uh, to financial services, uh, but really a shift to what you could call production, corruption and predation. Uh, and this is prepared by the huge fall in interest rates, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, dominate this period and result from the slowdown uh, in, in the economy. So the cost of money is ever cheaper and it opens the way to a, a, a period of what you of uh, risky lending uh, and uh, speculation in the um, <coughs> Uh, in in the asset market and asset markets, um, so in effect here you have the politically bent uh, operation of the 
uh, market. Uh, and here you have uh, its results. Uh, financial profits is a percentage of corporate profits. You can see this uh, taking off uh, after 1980. Corporate profits uh, and uh, uh, running ahead of, uh, I mean, stock market valuation running ahead of corporate uh, profits. Uh, this is uh, table 19. Um, the use of profits, uh, not so much to invest, but to um, pay out dividends and, and buybacks. Again, uh, we're talking about this uh, post-1980 uh, 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 turn. And let's see, I think that is essentially uh, where uh, I've gone on way too long, so I, I should, uh, should end it uh, right there. Uh, stagnation, um, politically driven upward redistribution, and this taking especially the, the form of uh, politically based uh, returns or corruption um, in uh, as a, a, a way of talking about a shift of finance. It's not really the kind of shift of finance that you had. It's not really a shift of finance in a technical sense that you have in the post-war uh, period or in the period before World War I, but a shift to um, uh, corruption payoffs the uh, essentially the political payoffs of the process that um, the processes I've been uh, talking about. Sorry, I've uh, went on for so long. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak. I, I look forward to the discussion.